All right. Good evening, everyone. We are uh, continuing on with the prophet Habakkuk. We'll start chapter two in just a second. Uh, first, let's say a prayer. Let's pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Loom in our hearts, O master, love us mankind with the pure light of thy divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our mind, the understanding of thy gospel teachings. Plant us also the fear of thy blessed commandments, that trampling down all carnal desires, may enter upon a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing such things that are well pleasing unto thee. Thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God. And to thee do we ascribe glory to get the honor of Father, and all holy good and life giving spirit, now and ever, and unto the age of ages. Amen. Amen. So last time when we were talking about the prophet Joel, talked about how if you really want to know how the Orthodox Church uh, thinks about someone, you should uh, start with uh, the verses on Lord I Cry from Vespers. So uh, Prophet Habakkuk is uh, name days two days from now, December 2nd. Um, and this is the first thing we hear at Vespers. On receiving the Spirit's ray, the most marvelous Abakum is become like God. Wherefore, as he doth behold, the judge's godlessness and the unjust judgment that they pronounce, he is greatly vexed thereat. And not brooking their wickedness, he upbraided them. With much fervor of heart and love for God, he showing his upright disposition towards God, the Master and Lord of all. Um, so we'll come back to some more things there um, as we get into this. Okay, um, so chapter two, um, I will stand on, on my watch, mounted upon the rock, and see what he shall say to me, what might I answer when I am reproved? Um, so standing on the watch means he's a, a soldier. He's he's on the watch out uh, to guard God's kingdom. Um, trying to see what, what he can see to make sure that... Um, he does what he can to protect um, the kingdom of God on earth. Um, and so this is, uh, and it continues, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision distinctly upon a tablet that he who reads it may flee. For a vision is yet for the appointed time, and it will come, upon, come up at the end and will not be in vain. If he should tarry, wait for him, for he will surely come. He will not tarry. All right. Um, so he will come. If we were reading this in any of the Protestant translations, what it would say is it will come. Okay. Um, so we understand that he will come. This is a prophecy of uh, the coming Messiah. Okay? That, that's who he is. I and mean, it's the only thing that makes sense. But when you change he to it, um, then you got to look, well, what's the it that's going to come? And you're tempted to look back at um, at, at what's going on here. Um, and, and who is this it? Is that the vision? You know, for the vision is yet for a point of time and it will come at the appointed time. Well, so you don't really understand this is a mess messianic prophecy that uh, Habakkuk is uh, saying here. Um but that's what's coming. You know, he will surely come. Um, not it will surely come. Not that you'll definitely have visions, even though we're going to get to visions uh, here shortly. Um, but this is the, the Messiah will come. Okay. Um, and and uh, the other quick thing is um, in Greek, his name is Abakum. Uh, Habakkuk is uh, how it's translated, I think, from the uh, the Hebrew. Um, so when I'm, when I'm reading the things from the uh, services, it's almost always going to be Abakum, not Habakkuk. Uh, so don't, it's the same guy, same name, different language. Where are we? Chapter uh, two. Chapter okay. two, verse three. Right. All right. Um, now verse four. If any man should shrink back, my soul will not be well pleased in him but the righteous shall live by my faith. Okay, huge, huge thing. Um, so St. Paul quotes that uh, a number of times. Um, you know, the righteous shall live by faith. Um, this already shows that when the law was, you might say paramount, the law was 
in effect, there, there was no Messiah yet. Still, the whole point was to live by faith. And this is by faithfulness. Um, another translation issue, almost always when we read, read faith in scripture, it really should be faithfulness, okay? So there's the old debate, uh, you know, what's the difference between faith and belief? Well, if you think of faith is really just adhering to some doctrine, then there is no difference, right? But if you think, when you say faith, you think faithfulness, then there's a huge difference, okay? Anybody can believe. I mean, the demons believe that Christ is, is the Son of God, but what difference does that make to their, to their existence? None, you know? But if we believe that Jesus is the Christ and then are faithful to what he says, then faith in that sense means something different than belief, totally different. Um, so when we say faith here, we're talking about faithfulness, you know? So like that starts with, you know, when Christ asks, you know, what's the greatest commandment of the law? You shall love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul and your neighbors yourself. That's the Old Testament. He's quoting the Old Testament for the guys talk to quotes the Old Testament. And Christ says, you, you've spoken rightly, right? So it's not new that the rules, the laws um, are there to as guides, but we still have to live with faithfulness. And this is like the third most quoted part of the Old Testament and the New Testament, the righteous shall live by faith. But that's what we're talking about here is the faithfulness and it's not something new to Christianity. It's part of Judaism from the beginning, right? So, let's see. Um, let's see. So this book I have is not arranged uh, verse by verse, but topically. And there was something specific here. Let me see if I can find your ah, Okay. Um, so on this verse, the righteous, the just or the righteous shall live by faith. Uh, St. Cyprian of Carthage declares that Jews could understand nothing of the scriptures unless they first believed in Christ. Righteousness should not subs should subsist by faith and that in it was life as predicted by the prophet Habakkuk. Elsewhere, St. Cyprian adds, faith is of the advantage together, and we can do as much as we, as we believe. But the one who is drunk in the scoff, or the man who boasts, shall accomplish nothing. He widened his soul as the grave, and as death he is never satisfied. He will gather to himself all the nations, will take to himself all the peoples, okay? Um, so uh, the man who boasts, this is talking about pride, how pride is uh, sort of the linchpin of all other uh, sins, thank you. Um, but when we do things our way, when we follow our will, then we're sure to fall uh, because the demons are there whispering on our ears and we're not strong enough to fight the demons by ourselves. And our pride says we are. Right? I'm good enough, strong enough. I'm righteous. <laughs> uh, so, um, and he'll gather himself all the nations, okay? All the nations uh, is sort of everybody outside of Judaism, generally when we see that in scripture, um, that it's all those who don't have the law, don't have the, you know, and again, that's uh, a translation issue. Torah should really probably be translated in English as the teachings. Um, so it's not law as these are law books that, you know, <laughs> uh, you get put in jail if you break these laws. It's like, no, these are the teachings. This is teaching you how to live. Um, how to live by faith. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Shall not all these take up a parable against him as a proverb for his history? And they shall say, Woe to him who multiplies to himself possessions which are not his. How long will this continue? And who heavily presses down his yoke? Um, okay. So that is about all those who are um, 
unjust in this life, pushing down on other people. You know, the the landlord who uh, keeps raising the rent, the the ruler, the tax collector who takes more than what he's uh, supposed to collect, the ruler that uh, you know impresses people for corvée labor. Uh, you know, to build all his things. Uh, you know, so all of those things are oppressive. Okay, um, and so you know, it's woe to those. You know, how long will he press down on his yoke? What's that mean? Well, the Messiah that he's already referred to is going to come and set all this right. Okay. For suddenly those biting at him shall rise up, and they who plot against him you will sober, you will sober up, and you shall be as plunder to them. Um, um, because you have plundered many nations, all the people who remain shall plunder you because of the men's blood and the sins of the land and the city and all those who dwell in it. Um, so the sins of the land, um, we mostly have inherited a Western outlook about sin being between the person and God. Uh, you know, I confess my sins, I have to get, you know, absolved of my sins, but sin infects the whole land. And so many of the things that, uh, where the, the Jewish customs were meant to purge sin from the land or from the country. Yeah. And so that's what they're, they're referring to him. You know, uh, you know, because of men's blood and the sins of the land, um, that we're all um, infected, you know, it's a pestilence, right? Sin's crouching at your door. Has it changed much? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Woe to him who takes advantage of evil gain for his own house, so that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the hand of evil. Okay. Uh, so again, just you know, quit oppressing your fellow countrymen. You counseled shame to your house and you wiped out many peoples and your soul sinned. Therefore, the stones will cry out from the wall and the beetle out of the wood. Okay. Um, so this is then picked up by Christ when he says uh, they at, at the Palm Sunday, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees saying, you know, stop these people from calling out Hosanna, King of David. And Christ says, if these were silent, the stones themselves would cry out. And so that's a reflection here of what uh, Habakkuk is talking about. The stones will cry out from the wall. I mean, when the Messiah comes, they can't keep silent. Okay. Um, Again, the beetle will speak out from the wood. It's another place where we have um, translation issues. Okay. Um, so according to Ambrose of Milan, the beetle in the wood is a reference to Christ. Okay. Um, let me see if I can find it here. Okay. Um, so in the RSV in the King James Version, uh, both say the stones cry out, but the beam from the wood responds. Okay, so the beam from the wood gives you no idea how's that the cross, or right? doesn't doesn't foreshadow the cross. But the beetle from the wood, what's the beetle? You know, it's something on the wood is gonna uh, cry out here. Um, let's see, you know, the beetle will speak out of the wood. So that's Christ speaking out of the cross. But if you have this funny Protestant translation, you get no hint that Habakkuk's aware of what he's, the, of the prophecy of Habakkuk. Right? So it's, it's very important that we stick with the Orthodox Study Bible. And we only pray that we would someday get an Orthodox New Testament, but yeah. time will come, time will come. All right. Um, so we're going to jump ahead here just a little bit to... Uh, verse 19, uh, and we're going to come back to this. Woe to him saying to the wood, awake and rise up, and to the dumb stone be exalted. Okay. Um, so we have the stone and the wood together, um, and um, you know there's no living breath in it at all, as continuing on in verse 19. Um, so we're supposed to understand that um, 
you know, they're, they're oracles, they're oracles of, of Christ, the coming Messiah, um, and that these are, uh, when anytime these themes are repeated, the stones and the wood, that we're supposed to pay attention. You know, you're not supposed to forget just what you read a minute ago, right? You're supposed to keep it all in mind as you keep going through here. All right. Okay. All right. Woe to him. Um, I'm sorry, back to verse 12. Woe to him, him who builds a city with bloodshed, who establishes a city by wrongdoing. Okay, fairly straightforward. Are these, are not these things from the Lord Almighty? And many people have utterly perished in fire, and many nations have been dis, have been disheartened. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, and it shall cover them as with water. Okay. Uh, so this looks back to the Noah's flood, right? So when if you establish the world through uh, bloodshed, then even then it's God's going to take a recompense. Okay. Um, so it's going to be covered with water. Um, even though God's you know, said it to Noah, I won't ever come with water again. doesn't mean that he won't do something to uh, banish sin from the land that he created. Um, okay. Um, you know, so, and the earth shall be filled with the glory with knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Um, so even if we're perishing, we're going to see the second coming, right? Um, so we will have that sort of in our face. And we can't escape it. And that's what it means when it's covered is by water is that there's nothing we can do to escape that it's coming. All we can do is live by faith, live by faithfulness. Um, okay. Woe to him who gives clouded and intoxicating drink to his neighbor, that he may look upon his private parts. Okay. <laughs> There's a prophecy for today if there ever was one. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, that's uh, what we love about scriptures. It really tells it like it is. <laughs> um, drink to the fullness of the dishonor of your glory. Quake and tremble. The cup in the right hand of the Lord has surrounded you and has gathered disgrace upon your glory. Um, so the things that we glorify in, you know, just look at the news and see all the stuff happening in the world. And, you know, it will be gathered as disgrace. The, the glory of the Lord will make that disgraceful. Um, and it's coming. from okay. The ungodliness of Lebanon shall cover you and the stress of wild beasts will terrify you because the blood of men and the ungodliness of the land and all who dwell in it. Okay. Um, yeah. So here's the prophecy of, uh, of pretty much every time, <laughs> ever since Cain killed Abel, that this this is what's going on. Um, you know, the stress of wild beasts will kill you. Um, the blood of men and the ungodliness of the land and all who dwell in it. Um, you know, so that the Messiah's got to come and take care of all this. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, verse 18. What benefit is a graven image since men carve it? They have formed it into a molten image, a false image. The one who made the thing trusts in that which is formed by him to make idols that cannot speak. Uh, so here is uh, the whole crux of pagan worship, um, pagan understandings of, of even how life exists. Okay, so in the, this time, and remember, um, I'm not exactly sure exactly when Habakkuk lived, but probably about uh, 500 BC, maybe before. Um, so at that time, everybody believed in gods. Okay? Um, outside of Israel, people made images of various kinds, okay, and uh, set up their temples they made sacrifices burnt incense did, did those things and the whole point was that that god then was sort of required to provide you benefits you know, favorable hearths you know sons and daughters around about your table whatever the thing was um so in about the 
third century, fourth century, Rome sent an army into Germany. Now, Teutonberg Forest is the name of the battle. And the Germans like totally wiped out the Roman army as legions that had been sent in. Um, so much so that they uh Rome quit trying to conquer Germany and said, okay, the Rhine River will be a nice border. Uh, you know, we can maybe protect that. Uh, and for years afterwards, uh people in the Roman Empire would go throw rocks and mud at temples, uh, at some of the temples of the Roman gods, because they had fallen down. Uh, on their job that the Romans had made the proper sacrifices and the gods didn't give them victory. So that's how they're looking at this. Okay. And so when we read here about uh, the graven images that men carve it, well, the men carved it because they had an expectation of these gods they made would then provide for them. Right? You know, we, we gave you food and drink, so you've got to bless us in, in, in exchange. Um, now, how any of these gods actually had any power here on earth, it's because they um, accessed the demons, okay? Um, so God provided uh, essentially guardian angels for all the nations. Uh, Mo Archangel Michael was assigned to Israel. Um and he's the only one that we know that never succumbed to the uh, praises of the people, where many of them, sometimes it's, you know, you, you tell somebody uh, you're great often enough and they start thinking they're great, right? So that's the way these uh, angels uh, reacted to all the worship of the people. They became, uh, they became came demons and quit trying to enforce God law, God's law, they started taking upon themselves this uh, on this right to, to rule um, these, these countries. Okay. So, so that's, that's these graven images and, and the gods that are behind them. Okay. Woe to you, woe to him saying to the wood, awake and rise up, and to the dumb stone be exalted. Um, so obviously, if you're, you know, if the wood and the stone is the false idols, then you're not uh, getting anything. Okay, it is merely a fantasy. Okay? Uh, so if you bring to the lumps of 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 wood and stone, that you know, it's all in your mind, right? Being but a hammered piece of gold and silver. Okay, there is no living breath in it at all. Okay. Um, so when these pagan uh, idols were created, they were, you know, dressed, they were put in temples, and the last thing that was happened is they would uh, do a, a service, it was called opening the nostrils, uh, sort of believing that this was the uh, ceremony that was required to bring life to the, to the uh, pagan idol, okay? Um, and so that's, I think, being referenced him. Um, let's see, it, okay. there's no living breath in it at all. It's referring to uh, that specific part of the pagan uh, opening of the nostril ritual uh, to uh, establish a pagan god. Okay. But the Lord, and that's the Yahweh, is in his holy temple let all the earth be reverent before him. Okay, so here we've got, you know, all the whole world should be giving uh, homage to the true God and the guardian angels of all the nations should have been assisting people in doing that rather than intercepting the prayer and the worship for themselves. Okay, that's sort of the big problem in uh, the world. I was going to say the ancient world, but it's actually probably still going on you know that uh, only now we have our ourselves we, we try to accept god's uh, glory for ourselves and that leads to uh, all the trouble that we have in this world right now we have people that believe that that god did not make them in there of his image and his likeness and they're going to change it right oh right. Yes. <laughs> i'm serious i mean this is this is this is where we've come 
You know, God didn't make a perfect world. We, we have people that are trying to manufacture meat out of plants right. because God's God's meat's not perfect enough. Right. You know? This is because it creates methane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Yes. laughs> yeah. I mean, this is this, this we thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years, and we have not come any closer in some right. respects to God. Right. We've, become, we've probably become even further. Right. further. Yes. All right, because we have more control over the natural world. We think we have more control. Right. Over <laughs> yeah. We think we have more control. Talk about that volcano in Hawaii. It tells us who's yeah, in right. this box. Yeah, stand there in that volcano and tell me that you you know that you can change what that volcano is doing. Yeah. It's quite right. a case. Yeah. Here it's right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so I mean, this, so this is. Uh, um, the crux of, of the, the religious life, you know, the Lord is in his home and be temple, be reverent before him. Right? Uh, okay. Um, so, all right. Chapter three. Okay. Chapter three is uh, an ode. And in fact, it starts the prayer of prophet Habakkuk with an ode. Um, this is, I explained uh, last week is the basis for the fourth ode at Matins. Um, and it is, um, he, he is often referred to in the fourth ode, but even if he's not directly referred to, this is taken as sort of the paradigm of what the fourth ode should be about, okay? Um, okay. Um, Lord, I've heard your report and was afraid, okay? Um, so we've listened to God, and we're afraid in the sense of God's awesome. You know, we fall down before him because of his awesomeness, okay? Um, I considered your works and was greatly astonished, okay? You shall be known between the two living creatures, okay? Um, so this is another messianic prophecy. Uh, the you, the Lord, shall be known between the two living creatures is... Um, being known um, between the Old and the New Testaments, okay? So Christ is, you know, like he says, you know, Moses wrote about him. Um, and on the road to Emmaus, he teaches uh, Cleopas and Luke. Uh, everything was written about him in the Law and the Psalms and the Prophets. So all of this Old Testament is about Christ. And clearly the New Testament is about Christ. And so he's between them as uh, sort of the guide for both of them you know he's the pinnacle like he's got these two props uh, and it's not he's between them like he's holding off two warring parties or anything but he's between them uh, as in um, he's a stride one there you go he's right right Okay. Um, okay, in the approaching years, you will be acknowledged. Um, so that is a continuing of the the Messiah is coming. You will be revealed when the time comes. When my soul is troubled, you will in wrath remember mercy. Okay. Um, so, um, since we're now in the Christmas season, we have um, the Nativity Canon, which is coming up. Okay. The rod of the root of Jesse and the flower that blossomed from his stem, O Christ, thou hast sprung from the virgin, from the mountain densely overshadowed, thou hast come, O praised one, made flesh of her that knew not wedlock, O thou who art. Are immaterial, 
immateriate, and God, glory to thy power, O Lord. Okay. Um, get to some more of that in just a second. Um, so, um, now verse three, God will come from Teman, the Holy One from the Mount of Shady Leaves. This is a prophecy of the Virgin. So she's the one who's overshadowed. Um, and Teman means the south. And we believe that Christ being born in Bethlehem south of Jerusalem is a fulfillment of this particular line of Habakkuk's ode. Um, and in uh, so very often we find that uh, Mary is referred to um, as the one overshadowed, and there was uh, so in the fourth ode of the uh, entry of the Theotokos in the temple uh, talks about the Virgin is uh, the over compared to the overshadowed mountain that Habakkuk saw. Um, um, so look back at for feast of Habakkuk. Mm -hmm. okay. From Teman has God come forth incarnate, as thou foretoldest, O thrice blessed Dabakum, enlightened by him the splendor from afar, he made the whole world to shine with light. Uh, so that's Ode 6. Uh, so, and that's where the church is using this image of Themen and the overshadowing mountain referring to Mary. Uh, and it's part of our hymnology here. Um, shine, shine on the souls of them that sing my praise, O God, through the intercessions of the august and godly mind of Abacum, O thou who didst illuminate his mind with divine inspiration. Um, so and there's one service and I've looked at it today and couldn't find it um, where at the apostica all the verses are we keep repeating um, about the, the mountain overshadowing from Teman um, and I said uh, I remember seeing it during some service sometime. I looked for it today and I couldn't find it uh, to, to give you exactly where that is. Uh, if I find it, I'll be sure and tell you next time. Um, so it's something to keep uh, in mind when you hear about this teaming. What's, what's that mean? What's referring back to this specific phrase, Habakkuk's prophecy. All right. Okay, his excellence covered the heavens, and the earth is full of his praise. Right? Um, his brightness will be like the light, horns will be in his hand, and he established a mighty love of his strength. All right, let's. So again, um, you know, who's the Messiah? He's going to do all these things, okay? Uh, before his face, a word will go forth, okay? It'll go out by the shoes of his feet. The earth stood when a shaken to a fro. He looked and the nations melted away. Um, again, referring to the power of the Messiah. The mountains were shattered by force. The everlasting hills wasted away. The place of distresses, I saw eternal ways. The tents of the youth, the opens will be dismayed, even the tents of the land of Midian. Okay, so the reference here to his advancing feet to his shoes uh, is a foreshadowing that the Messiah will be truly man, right? He's not going to come and be a, 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 a 
a wraith of some sort. Uh, verse 8, were you angry, O Lord, with the rivers? Or was your wrath against the rivers or your fury against the sea that you will mount on your horses and your chariot is salvation? Okay. So the horses are a reference to the apostles. Okay. That, uh, let's see. Okay. Um, Gregory of Nyssa and the Blessed Jerome believes this cavalry, the, the horses and the chariots, is the angelic host, okay? But during the divine office, the prophet Abacum, the holy church chants the apostles as horses, as steeds. Listen to this hymn. Standing on divine watch, the honored Abacum heard the ineffable mystery of thy coming unto us, O Christ. And he most openly prophesied the proclamation of thee, foreseeing the all-wise apostles as steeds, roiling the sea of the many nations of the Gentiles. Um, and uh, St. John of Damascus, uh, in the for the Feast of St. Peter and Paul, Thou didst mount thy steeds, thine apostles, O Lord, and didst take their bridles in their hands. Thy chariot hast become salvation for those who chant with faith. Glory to thy power, O Lord. Uh, so the church has clearly you know, saw this as foreshadowing the whole of the, the New Testament revelation. All right. The land of the rivers will be torn asunder. It's Mesopotamia, the land of Babylon, which is the, you know, the paradigm of the evil nations that conquer uh, Jerusalem. Uh, many peoples will see you and be in travail, dispersing the water from its course. The abyss utters its voice, raising its form on high. Um, Uh, the sun arose, the moon stood in its course. Um, this is a reference to the ascension where Christ himself is obviously the sun arising and the moon standing in its course is the, the church. Um, it's a reference to the church. Okay, in The light of your arrows, they at the light of your arrows, they went forth. Okay, At the flashing of your gleaming weapons, you will bring low the land with threatening, you will break the nations in wrath, okay? So all of these things are references to the Holy Spirit coming, um, which, we, you know, last time in Joel, we heard about how, you know, the Holy Spirit, you're the, about prophecy coming and, and people speaking. This is a, a similar kind of reference to what's going to happen, okay? You will break the nations in wrath. You sent forth salvation for your people to save your anointed ones, okay? Your anointed, you know, your anointed ones is Christ. They're chrismed, uh, those who are anointed. Um, and so Christ is the anointed one. We are many anointed ones. Okay. Um, we take upon the name Christian. Okay. You brought death upon the heads of the lawless. You brought bonds upon their neck. Okay. Um, so this is re reference to you know, what's going to happen at the second coming, that the lawless, the ones who remain lawless, uh, they'll have the second death uh, from which there's no recovery. Okay? Uh, you will cut off the heads of the rulers of amazement. They shall tremble in it. They will break their vitals like a poor man eating secretly. You ran your horse in the sea, churning up many waters. Okay, So again, this uh, reference to the horses into the sea is a reference to the apostles churning up the nations, um, doing what he he wants. Okay. I will keep watch. My belly trembled from the sound of the prayer of my lips. Okay. Um, so this is interesting. In the ancient world, at least among the Greeks, there was a belief that your consciousness uh, actually came from your gut. You know, they didn't have this idea that uh, your brain was the seat of your, of, of you, you know. Um, so, uh, when it talks about this, you know, my belly trembled from the sound of prayer. That means that, you know, they're praying, but they're feeling in their guts, you know, uh, sort of gives a new interpretation to, you know, do what feels right in your gut. Right? Yeah. 
Uh, and, the trembled pen and the trembling penetrated into my bones. My very frame of mind was troubled. I shall rest in the day of tribulation to go up to the people of my sojourn. Right? So he's going to rest because why? He's been listening to God all this time. He's not uh, oppressed his neighbor and done those things. Okay? For though the fig tree will not bear fruit and there will be no grapes on the vines, the labor of the olive tree fail and the fields yield no food. Though the sheep have no pasture, there be no oxen in the cribs, yet I will glory in the Lord. I'll rejoice in God, my Savior. So this is the, you know, are we blessed when we have material things? No. What Habakkuk is saying, even if I've got nothing, I rejoice in God. Right? That's where it is. Okay? The Lord is my strength. He'll direct my feet to the end. He'll set me upon high places, so to conquer by his song. Um, and this last phrase uh, uh, is a reference to the, the psalm. I forget which one it is. Um, about uh, he'll set my uh, feet upon high places, on high places like the hind. Um, so this is a we're supposed to remember that psalm um, when, when we we hear that. Um, and again, so to conquer by his song. Uh, we talked about this at the beginning. Again, one of the problems with Protestant translations is they make they cut that off and they have to the choir master uh, upon stringed instruments. It's like what? <laughs> As you know, totally nothing to do with uh this ode or what's going on or what he's saying, you know, that you know God will set me up, right? So to conquer by his song, right? Uh, so you looked it up on your yeah. And, to the chief musician right. with my stringed instruments. Right. Yeah, it's like, what? Where are they? Uh, anyway, uh, so this prophet Habakkuk, uh, we've you know gone over and over in, in this, especially this third ode, that he's talking to the Jewish people to be ready for the Messiah. Okay. You're men uh, of blood. Verse 17, that sounds an awful lot like Joel. Yeah, yeah. Uh it, yeah, exactly. Um so you know the prophets are speaking the word of God, which is if we haven't talked about that before, that's what prophecy actually means. It's not about foretelling the truth. Prophecy is about speaking the word of God. And so we should not uh be surprised when we find similarities from one prophet to the next, okay? Uh, because it's all coming from God, right? Mm -hmm. Um so um let's see. um you know so as, as we saw at the very beginning Habakkuk won the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw so these prophets this isn't like oh you know I'm in touch with the universe um you know I'm in love with nature kind of stuff this when God talks to you and gives you a prophecy it's always work right it's trouble um uh, you know it's it's a terrible thing uh you know it's a terrible thing to fall in the hands of the, of the almighty god um uh, so these guys feel this burden uh i mean think of jonah he gets the, the prophetic word what's he want to do he wants to run and hide right he, he takes off for sea i ain't going i won't go he go want me oh god um all right so uh that is actually how things are um yeah. most common uh, just ask you one. for these guys hmm? okay just ask you one. oh yeah they're gonna kill me he's in the belly of the whale all right okay. That's, there was some let's see if i can find it but again, you read these things and you can't write them out again um Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, here it is. This is the O3. Um, 
the Theotokia on O3 at Matins uh, for December 2nd, the Feast of Prophet Abacum. That is the peers of mountain overshadowed with virtues since whence the master came forth as the servant to deliver men from servitude, all, all pure virgin. And so again, that mountain overshadowed is that part of the first part of uh, chapter three uh, about the coming from team and an overshadowing. Um, that's picked up again in that Theotokion. Um, and so, you know, so just pay attention uh, throughout the year about Teman, mountains overshadowing, uh, anything like that, uh, because what this when Luke talks about the Annunciation, uh, the uh, angel Gabriel says, and you should uh, the Spirit of the Lord will overshadow you. Okay, so that those things all tie together. That's what they're all meant to be interpreted together. Okay. Any last questions? Were you, were you thinking of uh, verse three there as being? Uh... You said it was it was red. Uh, in the footnotes, it says that it's uh, in the Orthodox analogy in the Festival Manian on the entry of the Most Holy Theotokos on the temple into the temple and on Christmas. Yeah, it's red. Yeah, it must be. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Sure. <laughs> uh, anyway. So uh, unfortunately, when um. Why, why would we we should have we should have done that at Vespers on two weeks ago when we right. transferred the, the entrance. Yeah. But I've slept since then. Why not? <laughs> well, it also says on Christmas. Would it be in that on Christmas Day? Yes, yes. And the December book? Yeah. And in fact, that's what I read. Oh, that's what you read. Right. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, Okay. All right. So we will conclude unless there's any last questions about Abacook. Abacum. All right. Have a blessed evening.